Hello and welcome to Sam for Uncut, a podcast for developers about building great products. Today I am excited to welcome Jose Volin. Jose, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great. Please just uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. So I am Jose Valim, and I believe most people know me as the creator of Elixir. I am also, I like to say jokingly, the chief adoption officer at Dashbit. We are a company where we are helping startups and enterprise run and adopt Elixirs, you know, in different stages, different industries, and so on. And yeah, I think that's a very concise introduction. Yeah. And I myself, I'm coming from a Rails community. I have been working with Rails since 2008 or something like that. So I know you from being one of top contributors to Rails, being part of the core team, definitely. And you also worked on Ruby. So yeah, I know you from those times, but as you said, I guess today, the current generation knows you from Elixir primarily. Can you give us maybe a bit of a history, how you ended up doing what you are doing and how that progression came to the point where you felt that the world needs a language that will you know, address certain group of problems? Cool. Yeah. So as I said, I was a Ruby Rails developer. And at the time, you no, know, back 2008, we were starting to hear a lot about concurrency, right? So that was at the very beginning, one of the big papers that really kind of warned everybody that concurrency was going to be the future was from 2005. And we started to hear a lot about concurrency and that, you know, machines, they're going to have multiple cores. And I like to say like today, even your wristwatch has four cores, right? So we are definitely getting there. It's only getting more and more cores in our machines. There's AMD Ryzen and so on, where you can easily get 16, 24 cores. But back then, we already had these conversations like, oh, we need to run multiple cores because it's the future and so on. And I knew from experience from maintaining Rails and other Ruby projects that writing multi-core software, which is software that runs on all cores with Ruby, it was not really straightforward. So for example, we were trying to like make Rails thread safe and sometimes it would get like a bug report that would be like, when we are having a spike in production and we deploy a new server, we have this error, but we don't have this error any other time. Right. And that would mean is that, you know, when there is a spike in production and deploy a new server, there's a bunch of requests coming at the same time. And that is going to exercise some code paths that it's very hard to exercise otherwise that would make bad things happen. And, you know, those things, they were hard to debug, hard to understand, hard to fix. And I started looking, you know, originally I started to say, okay, if concurrency is going to be important, I want to see how people are solving those problems. So, Everything started with an effort like just being curious and maybe see how we can improve the situation. And throughout this journey, I like to say there were two particular moments of like no return where I said, okay, like that effectively changed the way I thought about software. The first one was functional programming. And functional programming can mean a lot of different things to a bunch of people. But to me, what it meant at the time was immutability, right? Because a lot of the times, you know, when we are working with most languages that are imperative languages, you know, Ruby, Java, JavaScript, Python, C, is that a lot of the issues that we have with concurrency is because we are changing things in memory, right? So for example, if you have a list or an array and you delete an element from that array, you are changing that array in memory. You're changing the representation memory. So what happens is that if you have two threads trying to change the same place in memory, you have two cores in your machine trying to change the same place in memory, they can corrupt that memory or they can put in a state that is not understandable. In functional languages, generally we avoid doing that. So everything is immutable. If you have a list of three elements, you delete one element. Now you have a list with two elements and it's a whole new list. And this may sound inefficient, but there are a lot of interesting things that we can do to make this as efficient as possible. It's a whole separate discussion. We don't need to go there. <laughs> but that was when things clicked for me. I understood like, wait, if I'm not mutating my data structures, if everything is immutable, there is a whole category of problems that I have been debugging and trying to fix in the past that they no longer exist, right? And to me, like that's like 
my favorite way of solving problems, right? I can fix problem, but if I can disappear with the root cause of the problem altogether, yeah, I'll take that, right? So I was like, okay, this is great. Like if I'm following those principles, I think my software is going to be better. It is going to be ready for this multi-core future. And that was the first point of no return. And the second point of no return was when I found out about the Erlang virtual machine. And the thing about the Erlang virtual machine is that back when I was exploring those things, 2010, 2009, everybody was talking about concurrency, right? We had new languages, we had Go, we had Clojure that had a strong focus on concurrency. But the focus of the Erlang virtual machine was not concurrency. It was distribution and it has been distribution for three decades, right? And here's the thing. So imagine that you're writing your software and you wanted to use a single machine as efficiently as possible, right? So if the machine has like eight cores, you're going to leverage concurrency, right? But what happens when that machine is not enough, right? You cannot run everything your system has to do or a single machine. Or if you want to have two machines because you want some resilience, right? You want to have some robustness there, not to have one single machine in production. You need to have multiple machines. So how can you make those multiple machines now communicate and collaborate together? That's exactly when distribution comes in. And so, you know, for me, when I learned more about the Erlang virtual machine, it was like this, everybody is trying to solve the issues with concurrency, but, you know, we have this virtual machine, the Erlang virtual machine that has already solved those issues and they are now talking about distribution. So they are kind of ahead of everybody. And I still believe the virtual machines in this sense is still ahead of everybody today. So, you know, it was true 10 years ago, still true today. And then I said, okay, this is the platform that I want to build software with. So I started using more and more the Erlang virtual machine and the Erlang language. I found out about some places that I, I would like to improve the language or there are like some particular kinds of software, some particular kind of constructs that I felt were important and they were not there. And that's when I decided to start working on Elixir. Yeah, great. Thank you for all that work. <laughs> hey, everyone. Sanford has published an open source book called CI-CD with Docker and Kubernetes. It combines just the right amount of best practices and practical advice for shipping cloud native apps. Download your free copy today at sanfordci.com. One thing that I can mention is, uh, as our listeners know, we are running like a CIC, the business, and it was like 2011, roughly, when we started creating it. And at that time, we were also primarily focused on using Ruby. And generally, I remember when we Googled around generally writing distributed systems, because as a you know, CI, CD, you have to have some job, you have to send it somewhere, it will be on some other machine and so on. And then there is that network in between. So yeah, you like it or not, you have distributed system straight away. And I remember generally, you know, when you Google on that topic, you want to, you know, know more about it. There was that academia. There were like, you know, books published by Springer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, on distributed system, 500 plus pages long and so on. Very impractical for our use case. And the only thing sitting on the other side was Erlang. However, we were like super small at that point And yeah, we just didn't have the capacity to adopt it, you know, and to kind of make a move and do that. Maybe it was like 2009 or something like that. I don't remember. Cannot guess it now. But generally in the very early days when we heard about Elixir, and it was close to the Ruby community. Maybe you can share more on that, but maybe like a majority of people who initially like entered the Elixir world were probably from the Ruby world. So there is that, you know, syntax is approachable or let's say similar, but yeah, it's just, let's say a smaller piece, important as for developers, but a smaller piece. So yeah, just wanted to jump in on that and say what was our experience of seeing also the Erlang as a language, as a VM, as like a singleton in this world. There is nothing else if you want to just take something off the shelf and start using it. At least it was for us. Yeah, and just to add to that of Erlang being a singleton, it's like, sure, like, can you build like distributed systems with other platforms? It's like, sure, you can do it, right? But what makes the Erlang singleton is that it's part of the package, right? You can't install Erlang without the distribution. 
And when you have things there by default, it's there, it's part of the package. It makes it more accessible. The tooling is built around it. So I like to say, for example, you know, can you write concurrent software, you know, in Ruby, Java, and so on? It's like, sure, you can, right? But when the constructs, they are more accessible, they are more digestible, everything is going to use it more and more. So, you know, everything you do in Elixir, for example, all the tooling that we wrote, we were very careful to make sure that everything is concurrent, right? Like, so, oh, compiling code, we are going to use all cores. Fetching dependencies using all cores. Oh, you want to run your tasks concurrently? Sure, it's going to use all cores. Even if you're having tasks that need to talk to the database, we have the tooling so you can have tasks running concurrently. And even if they're talking to the database, for me, for example, that I'm writing, implementing a lot of those tools, concurrency is never an afterthought. It's always there at the beginning. It's an assumption that it's with you since the beginning. And the same thing, oh, maybe you want to make it easy for those particular tasks to run distributed. The tooling is there. So that makes a big difference, right? It's the difference in between being possible and promoting it and making sure that the whole experience is first class, right? So to a point today, like if I'm using some developer tooling, for example, and it's taking time, and then I go see the CPU graph, and it's using only one CPU, I get angry. Legitimately, I, I get angry. I like, I feel like disrespected, you know, like in a jokey way. It's like, I want this to be efficient. This thing is wasting my time. I want this thing to go as fast as possible because that's how I'm going to feel productive. Yeah. On feeling angry, I guess all the people that had experiences with Ruby World uh, know that there is that type of compiling Nokogiri when you are installing dependencies. So it never crossed my mind to run the top and check if all the cores are being used when it's done. I guess they are, but yeah. I agree with that on that topic of being there, being very accessible, and yeah, then you will use it. There is all that experience thing when you need to do something. So if I need to instantiate that mutex in C or wherever, it's like a super sharp tool and there is like absolutely no chance that I will not cut my finger while doing that. And yeah, if doing that, so the same thing in Erlang and then Elixir, it's a completely different experience. Yeah. Okay, and around the topic of concurrency, it was obvious a decade ago that it will become a thing. It's great that you mentioned, you know, generally that arm hasn't crossed my mind, but yes, it's the area where the number of cores is pushed, you know, super high. What are your experiences with people generally wrapping their minds around concurrency and using it? I know that for us, it was a journey for each individual developer in our company. It was a different path with a different learning, you know, how they learn it. Can you maybe share generally how that part of the language is being adopted and used? What are your experiences? Sure. So I think one thing that's worth talking about is that Elixir doesn't solve all concurrency issues. And then you just write the software and there are like no concurrency issues whatsoever. So it does remove the majority of data issues, which were the issues that we we're talking about. Like imagine you have two threads or two cores trying to change the same place in memory. The huge majority of those, they are removed. But you still have concurrency issues. But I don't know if there's a better word for this, but I like to say like, those are natural concurrency issues. Right. It's like, imagine there is a cup of glass on the table. Two people are going to get it at the same time. Right. Like you can't split the glass. Right. Somebody get half of the glass. The water is going to spill everywhere. Right. So you still need to think about those things. So those are natural concurrency issues and they exist everywhere. So, for example, well, you know, if you're doing a bidding website, right, if you're not looking at your database, like two users can win the same auction. Right. So you have concurrency issues with the database. You need to think, you know, if you're building a single page application, right, where you have some state on the client, some state on the server, you need to think, well, what happens if the client state changes and the server state changes? So all those things, they still exist. They do not disappear. And there is no way that Elixir can solve it. But what I found is that because the way that you model concurrency issues in Elixir is by having this idea of actors. In the community, we call them processes. Those are lightweight processes. They're not operating system processes. But I'm going to go with the less confusing term in general, which is actors. So we have actors and actors, they communicate with messages. It's such a natural way to think about concurrency. 
that once you get familiar with the way that Elixir models concurrency and approaches concurrency, you're actually better prepared to think about those natural issues that happen. It helps you develop a mental model of, you know, wait, can a concurrency issue happen here now that I'm using the database, right? So it's going to give you a mental framework to approach those problems in general. And I think that's very important because it's hard for you to build this general mental model if you're working with low-level libraries like Mutex, Semaphore, and so on. At least for me, I did not build this intuition even though I had the background to work with those lower-level tools. So in a nutshell, like there's still definitely a learning curve, right? There are still problems, but I think the framework that you're going to build because of it, the mental framework, is going to help you, you know, as a developer, as a engineer in general throughout your career and how you're going to approach those problems, right? With the database, when you have clients and servers or systems in general, it's going to give that foundation. Hey, I'm going to take a quick break here and tell you that Semaphore has a new book out called CICD with Docker and Kubernetes. If you are looking to deploy cloud-native apps, it's going to show you the most productive way of doing that. And the best of all, it's free. Download your free copy today at semaphoreci.com. Now, while you were talking about this, I would say that I had no prior experience with functional languages prior to trying Erlang and then later Elixir. And that message passing as a concept was like a wow moment for me, how that as an abstraction can just help you, you know, gives you wheels to easily solve those kinds of problems. Okay. Something that might be also interesting for folks listening is how generally looks at the journey of creating the language. If you look back and connecting with that, how do you work and how do you plan future iterations? Because this is obviously like a, decade long, will be decade long project with a huge impact. I've talked with other people, you know, who have been involved in languages and so on. And it feels like different people that have like different approaches to this. My approach in particular, especially at the beginning. So at the beginning I had, you know, I was mostly driven by curiosity and trying things out. I did not know Elixir would actually be a thing. And I built some prototypes and after building the prototypes, playing with a couple of things, the prototypes, they kind of failed. You expect a prototype to fail in a way, but the important thing about the prototype is the lessons you learn from it. So I did a couple of those. And at some point I was actually able to come up with a, with a vision of what I thought Elixir could be. So this was back in 2012, the beginning of 2012, where I had this vision of like, you know, what Elixir could be. And this was, a year after building different things, different prototypes. And at the moment where it was clear, like at least the goals for the language, then everything was much easier because I had a direction like, oh, this is what I should do. And I had like, no, I had the North. So because if you think about creating a programming language, there are like just so many options that you can take, just so many different approaches that without you having this North, this direction, it's pretty daunting for you to say, oh, the language is going to have this and this and that. So with this direction, it was really helpful. And then I was able to go to my company, do a presentation to them, it was platform attack at the time, and say then, like, this is what I want the language to be. This is why I think the language is going to be important. And this is why I even think like there is a chance that this can work and other people can use the language. So, you know, they accepted the proposal for me to work part-time on it. And I have been working on it for, I think it was like a year and a half. And I made it pretty clear to everybody, like, this is a high risk project. There is a chance, you know, I'm going to invest like years of work in here and we are going to get zero from it, nothing. And it was pretty clear to everybody. And then after a year and a half working on this vision, more people started using it. And I saw like more people that were actually betting on it, writing books, putting their human hours into it. And that was when I started to, oh, like this may actually work after all. And it has been in a very exciting movement, you know, growth uh, since then. We see that, you know, there are like new people coming all the time and learning language, exploring and building new things, like solving completely new problems that, I personally wouldn't have thought about. 
and so on. So that was kind of the beginning, right? But then there is also the question, right? Okay, now that the beginning has passed because you are going to be 10 years, like at least the first commit is going to be 10 years old. So at the beginning of 2021, the first commit to Elixir is going to be 10 years old. But I wouldn't consider the language to be 10 years old because those first commits, they were like the prototype and all this kind of stuff. But now that I have been like 10 years on the road, right? Like, what does that mean? And one of the things that I had in mind for Elixir was that I wanted Elixir to be an extensible language. And what that means specifically is that I want Elixir like to kind of be a small, not like a super small language, but the language itself should be small and the developers should be able to get the language and extend to the domains that they want, right? So if you want to get Elixir for uh, data processing, you can do that. You can extend it to web development. You can use it for distributed systems, doing embedded devices and all of that. So that was the design of the language. I didn't want the language to be able to support all those things natively. You should be able to extend and grow the language. And what that means in terms of the language in the long term is that if we have to be constantly changing the language and constantly improving the language, this goal kind of failed, right? Because if the language is extensible for the whole ecosystem to grow and for the community to grow, the language doesn't need to change. Everybody can build on top of that. And we have seen exactly this happening. Like if you look at the last Elixir releases, we are working on the infrastructure, we're working on making the compiler faster. We are working on, you know, finding errors earlier and improving the developer experience. But we are not like introducing new abstractions and so on exactly because of this goal of the language being extensible and allowing you to create your own abstractions without changing it. So, you know, for Elixir itself, I feel like the language is on stable mode. We are continuously improving it, but it's not like big flash news. And the bulk of the work is happening rather in the ecosystem, right? With new ideas, new frameworks, new projects. Even myself today, I spend most time working on some tools that exist in the ecosystem that I like and that I use myself. That's actually where I spend most time rather than in the language itself. Yeah, sounds like a very successful model and also something that can, you know, hold for many years without major disruptions for the system, as we have seen in different languages that they had to change a lot. I wrote maybe 50 lines of Python code, but I know that that language was one of the kind of community suffered quite a bit. And from what I can recall, changes in the Ruby language were also like substantial comparing to what I have seen so far in Elixir. And hopefully to add some value to the conversation, coming from Ruby to Elixir, I was like, I don't know if the word amazed is too strong, but how small the language is. So I can kind of know everything. And I never had that feeling in Ruby. I always felt that there is, you know, so, so much more some deep parts of generally the syntax that I, you know, spending years in a Ruby never used or like, you know, rarely used. And just to make things a bit more concrete. So when you're talking about that extensibility of language is in practice, the tooling to achieve that generally the macros and the macro system that's available or there is something more. Yeah. So macros definitely play an important part of it, although in a way you don't want to overuse macros, right? So macros play an important role, not necessarily the macros themselves, but what we had to do to have the macros the way we have them in Elixir. So the Elixir syntax is quite regular in terms of constructs and things that they are in the language. And we had to do that because we wanted to have macros, like list-like macros. So it forced us since the beginning of how can we have as few constructs as possible but they will still allow us to express a bunch of different problems. So even if you're not using macros, the constructs added to the language, because we wanted to have macros, allow for that extensibility. And there is also the aspects of like how we make a software extensible as a whole. And for example, one of the features in Elixir that play an important part of that is protocols. Because protocols, they allow you know, library authors, for example, to define contracts. And users, they can, you know, fill in those contracts. So me as a library author, I can say, hey, I can create this library that is going to work with anything as long as this thing implements this contract. 
and then you can plug this hole and then you can have a bunch of libraries that are just depending on those contracts and allowing the, the ecosystem to grow without a lot of interference, you know, oh, I can't do this because this thing is expecting this from this other thing, right? Uh, without a lot of conflicts. So I think those would be like the three main principles, like macros, you know, you should not be using them really a lot, but they are really helpful from time to time. So for example, in Elixir itself, most of Elixir is written in Elixir and that's because of macro. So even like something like def module in Elixir, which we use to define modules or the def def like keyword, it's not really a keyword, but that we use to define functions. All those things, they're implemented in Elixir itself exactly because of this principle of, you know, being able to bootstrap the language so the language is accessible. So yeah, so macros and the syntax and the protocols, I think they are the foundation for our extensibility. And in the sense that sometimes you're not even using those things, but because we had to think of everything on top of those things, everything that was built on top of it, it's kind of extensible. Great, great. And since, let's say, you are holding this title of Uber programmer who created the language, in your, let's say, day-to-day -day work, what are maybe some tips that you could share with developers how you work today and how it maybe changed since you started working on the language, now primarily spending time in the language that you have created? The main tip I like to give is to be very mindful with distractions. I know this is something that you hear from other people, but for me, it makes such a big difference. So... I don't have anything that can interrupt me when I'm working. So like there's like no Slack notifications popping up when I'm working. There are like no email notifications. There's like my family. My family has a direct channel so they can reach out to me and they may be able to interrupt me. But other than that, it's like pretty much interruption free. So when sometimes I need to get in the zone and, you know, I'm working on a hard problem and I need to be like three hours deep in that thing and I cannot be interrupted. I can't afford to do that. So that's something that has been like extremely helpful. And I usually tell people like, just turn off. It's as if your computer is in do not disturb the whole time. Right. And then sure, like after you're done, you go and open up your email or something and go do something else and check what happens. So that's one of the things that I like to do. The other thing that I do as well is that I kind of do a pre-planning. For me, it's usually at the end of the day, but it doesn't need to be at the end of the day. It's like, I kind of think of what I'm going to do tomorrow. Not necessarily every day, but at some point of time, like if you're finishing a task and then I take like some time, like five to 10 minutes to think, oh, this is the thing that I'm going to do next. If there is any blocker, you can kind of remove that up front, but just to kind of warm up. Because a lot of the time when you have to start doing something new, the hardest part sometimes is just like getting that energy for starting that new thing, right? You just finish the, uh, something big and then you're like, ah, oh, you know, let me procrastinate a little bit. Let me spend time. And then if you take a little bit of planning before so you can think about the thing you're going to do next, most times it actually turns out that as soon as you finish this thing that you're doing right now, you kind of want to start the next one because you already put some effort into it. And then you're kind of curious, wait, like, I think I can solve it this way. Or I think that's how I'm going to approach this problem. So, you know, you're kind of excited and you're like, okay, I want to see if this works or if it doesn't work. And it helps remove blockers. It reduces kind of your potential downtime. So those are things that I do day to day and they kind of keep me going. There is one outside, which in this case works well for me, is that sometimes I am working on something and then I start planning the next thing. But the next thing that I want to do is super exciting that I drop the thing I'm doing right now. So I do the other thing. You know, I try to not do that a lot, but sometimes it does happen. So for example, like some of the libraries that we have released in the last like two, three years, like Nimble CSV, for example, which is a very CSV parser for Elixir, was because somebody was like, oh, you know, we're doing CSV parsing and that's really slow. And then I thought like, wait, I think I have an idea of how to implement a CSV parsing library that is going to be like extensible, like you can define your own parsers, but super fast at the same time. And then I disappeared from or for like three days, you know, while I was writing on this thing and then I came up like, try it out to the person like, oh, this is amazing. It's like 10 times faster than whatever I was doing. But I can't afford to do this because my time is kind of like, I'm working open source, right? So 
there is not really tight deadlines and this kind of thing. I know that not everybody can afford this luxury, but sometimes it's really exciting. And then three days after, I am like completely exhausted. I feel happy, like I feel rewarded, like I solved a hard problem, but I'm like completely exhausted. And I have like 50 emails that I have to answer now and catch up with life, but it's still fun. Yeah, deep focus is great, but yeah, that catching up part is always like, that gets you, yeah, after that. While you were talking about distractions, in the early 90s, I remember the area when there was like no internet. And if I was programming something in Visual Basic, there was that book, you know, and documentation that you had and your compiler and ID, there was nothing else. And then when internet became available, like the level of distractions that I'm self-inflicting on me was like skyrocketed. Yeah. And then as you can imagine for a teenager to, you know, <laughs> get into the discipline, it's like, yeah. Jose, thank you so much for uh, sharing all this with us. Good luck with the language and yeah, see you. Thank you very much. See you around.